My talk is going to be a little weird, perhaps. Uh, I have a I have a URL for you, which I'm going to paste in the chat. I'll paste this in the um, the functional Scala lobby. You guys can go here. Uh, it's just scalajs.surge.sh. Maybe I can also paste it in the the Zoom chat. Oh wow! Okay, the space buddies are arriving. All right, I'll let you guys pile in. Hopefully this doesn't explode. If it does, it's okay. I have, I have a local um, <laughs> local backup. I have not tested this out with 29 space buddies thus far, 30 space buddies. I'm sweating internally. We'll see what happens. <laughs> this could be, you know, a bad situation. We might blow up, but it'll be cool. Awesome. I'll just, uh, yeah. You could see the space buddies arriving down here. So while you all shuffle into this small, awkward craft, uh, we're, we're gonna be talking about full stack Scala today, which involves Scala.js, hence the URL and the, uh, the strange title. If you're familiar with the Stockholm syndrome being used in reference to a, a language called JavaScript. Okay, it seems to have held steady. Uh, should I start, Sandra? Yes, of course. Okay, all right. Well then, let's see what happens. Uh, first of all, that is the only sound effect in this talk in case that uh, frightened anyone. So hi, my name is Kit Langton, and today we're gonna talk about the pains of full stack development. But first, uh, in an effort to gain some you know, pre-pandemic normalcy, we will have a greeting, a bi-directional greeting. I would like to bestow you with some sort of muted, maybe Ouija board grade communication, except you're not dead. Um, so you try to say howdy back to me. You can use your keyboard, focus on a letter in your mind, and then press that letter on your keyboard. Now, these letters are gonna be ordered from left to right based on votes. So you can only communicate in heterograms. So if no one votes for a letter or thinks of a letter, it will not appear. But we can potentially, if we work together as a glorious hive mind, politely say howdy back to me. So H is the most votes, therefore it's all the way to the left. What we need next in, to get howdy is O. Now O has way too many <laughs> votes, and so now it's hoi. Well, this is a strange, when you communicate with the hive mind, things get very strange. You're doing quite nicely though. Uh, I'm, I'm actually pretty, pretty impressed. I've only tried this with five people before, so. How, oh my God, this is incredible. This, you know, howdy is in here. It's a, it's a proper subset. Uh, you know, we can't all communicate with hive minds. It's a strange alien language, but I will accept, I will accept your strange hive mind greeting and we can continue. I'm so impressed. I'm very impressed. Um, I had this back up in case I wasn't impressed, but I, I guess I'm sort of in between. I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm, mostly, I'm mostly impressed. Uh, <laughs> this is all my fault for thinking this is a, a good idea, but it is, it is. And you did wonderfully. And now that you're warmed up, uh, one other question, which is uh, why aren't you already using Scala.js? Feel free to hive mind it out now that you're all warmed up. Um, this is more free form, new, own, obun, ornbun, nisirbuj. Yeah, you can, yeah, that's awesome. I understand, that makes a lot of sense. Well, hopefully we can address that in today's talk. Now this one, we're going to sort of degrade the quality of communication and just go to a more reptilian thing, a poll. You can just hover your mouse over something. I'm, I'm curious what your favorite backend language is. Let's, let's, uh, let's just talk, let's wrap. All right, wow. Okay, a lot of Java, surprised. Uh, some Go, okay. My mortal enemies, Go. Uh, fascinating, okay, but it's a nice, a nice spread. That's, that's awesome. Oh no, <laughs> has it exploded? Uh, let's see. I might have exploded it, which is totally possible. <laughs> this was the the risk of trying it with uh, about a million people. Let me see. I'm gonna refresh. Yeah, I may have I may have blown my stack. Let's take a look. Has my server exploded entirely? That is that is very possible. I think I blew it up. Okay, which means onto the backup. Well, luckily we made it through most of the interaction portions. Quickly to start up iTerm. 
Let's take a look at how this works in the real ugly world. Luckily, I started very slightly early. We're going to go into my <laughs> library here. So accidental live coding. Let me make my screen real big. This is super exciting. Um, so first things, of course, Tmux, got to get this started. And then let's get a couple of panels up here. I'm going to run npm start in the rightmost one. Over here, I'm going to run SVT. I need two SVTs, one for the server and one for the compilation. Actually, I don't think I need to compile the front end because it's already been compiled. So npm starting. While that's starting, I'm going to start up the server. Let's do restart over here. So humbly switch back to the, uh, and that's a good error, right? It's always that that no main class is detected. That's a, that's a fine one. We can abide that. Uh, so yeah, that totally exploded. Um, and now there's just one space buddy, which is myself. So maybe come back to the regular Zoom. It was a worthwhile effort. Let me just double check to see if it's still totally dead. Yeah, I should have paid for a more expensive Heroku tier, but that's fine. We did the howdy. We greeted each other. It was beautiful. We made it. I asked you your favorite front-end language, and there was only one choice for this anyway. Um, so here we are. You learned some lessons. Uh, I needed to get 100 people. Anyway, that's fine. The interactive portion is mostly over. So let's get onto the agenda. We just did greetings, including blowing up the computer. Let me full screen this. So, and let me also make it much larger. So we blew up my computer. It was nice while it lasted. Good job. So let's talk about the predicament of full stack web development with uh, these days in which there is uh, an immense uh, amount of boilerplate and duplication and pain. We're going to talk about that first, and then we're going to experience it firsthand via some fake live coding in which we first experience and then overcome the pain. And lastly, we will take a rapid fire tour of a whole bunch of the libraries that we're using, particularly a Scala.js library, which is used for all of the superfluous animations and the front end here. So let's begin with act one, the predicament. So a full stack app presents itself as an immense accumulation of boilerplate, which simultaneously accomplishes very little for its immense weight in code. We mostly just drag data types kicking and screaming from SQL tables up to the front end in forms, and they leave a giant wake of uh, mutilation and duplication behind them. We're going to investigate a couple of varieties of this duplication, one here pithily inscribed as the interminable reinscription of structure. This is when you have a data type, for instance, here, a user with a name and an email, which must be replicated. The shadow of this data type is cast upon the entire code base. We have to tell the database what a user is. We have to tell our ORM what a data what a user is. We have to tell our case classes, our, our codecs, our servers, our APIs, our, our React tables and forms, et cetera. Over and over again, we reinscribe this getting RSI, experiencing immense amounts of pain. And along with this is the ceaseless bifurcation of logic. Whenever we have a non-isomorphic app that is a Scala backend with a JavaScript front end, we have to duplicate not only the data types, but we also have to often duplicate the logic, often validation concerns. And these have to be expressed in slightly different styles because of sort of JavaScript's muted expressibility. We don't have high level concepts such as options, and we have to awkwardly connect nulls and undefines with pipes when working in the world of TypeScript. And each of these duplications is an opportunity for a bug. It's each an opportunity to make a developer sad because we often must sort of douse around the code base blindly, command shift Fing, attempting to find every instance of duplication. There is no system that links all these together. Type systems help us for little like bouts for little legs of the relay race, but we often have to hunt for our next code segment to hand the baton off to. And each duplication wastes your time. All these bugs, all of this error, there's really no point in doing it. It's just giving your competitors an opportunity to usurp you and uh, kill your app. And I will blame all of this on JavaScript uh, for the time being, which has bound itself, latched itself to the concept of front end and sucked all of the blood out of it. It, it has become synonymous with front end. And therefore our quality of life when building front end applications is bound to that of JavaScript, which is immensely a very low ceiling. We stop thinking compositionally. We lose all of the, the pretty functional patterns that people are going to be discussing today and tomorrow. We stop modeling with ADTs. We stop making impossible states impossible re to represent. We just make everything a giant, big old, gobbled up mutable object. We accept these sums of boilerplate. And, and most uh, criminally, we uh, think XML is a good choice for writing our front ends in. Uh, I'm referring to JSX, which is the lingua franca of, of React. 
All in all, we think inside this yellow box, we constrain our imaginations. As one brief case in point, we can take a look at the Styled Components Library, which is a very popular React library, which allows you to build React components out of strings. Uh, all the compositional power of strings are bestowed to you by this library. Uh, and the problem isn't that this is not a useful library. In fact, the problem is that this is a very useful library. It is world renowned. It is used by 3 trillion companies, all of which um, hover back and forth across the bottom of this page. It's very useful, but it shouldn't be. We should be using other primitives, not strings. Uh, but when you start building with XML and you accept sort of the terms of JavaScript, you constrain your thinking, you're trapped in a box. So let's move on to the live coding segment, which is sponsored by the United Shapes Company, where shapes are dreams made from 100% meat, guaranteed. We're going to imagine that we are an employee of this Shapes Company, a full stack, a loyal full stack developer, and we get our JIRA tickets in the morning, and there's a new company initiative, which is that users are sick of the same old, same old, off-the-shelf rectangles. They wish to have some custom rectangles, custom bespoke rectangles that fit their personalities to use to feed their families, to defend their homes, and whatever you use rectangles for. So we're going to start and build this from the base of our mountain at the database. We're going to start with our schema. So we inscribe the structure of a rectangle first into the schema. We etch it in width, height, and of course, as you remember from geometry, all rectangles have a unique global identifier. And then we have to do this at the ORM layer. Here we're using slick. We're going to once again reinscribe the shape of a rectangle here at the slick layer. So width and height are once again reinscribed thusly. Next, we have to have an encoder such that we can pack our rectangle into bits and bytes and send it over the wire to the front end. So here, uh, we, we just do that again, width and height. We're getting RSI, we're starting, to, we're starting to weep slowly to ourselves into our hands. And then we have to cross the Rubicon up onto the front end, which always takes a moment. I like to stare at the window or recite a brief koan to myself to, to calm myself down. And it's installed, so now we're at TypeScript. And we can, uh, once again, inscribe the rectangle in TypeScript, slightly degraded form. Uh, notice how the UUID has sort of moldered into a string, and there's no longer a distinction between doubles and ints because we are in the, the weird land of JavaScript, uh, TypeScript here. Uh, and we have a fetch rectangles function, which is going to hit our Scala backend and grab us an array of these rectangles, which we can then pipe into a table. So once again, we must inscribe the structure of the rectangle into the table such that we can display it on the page. And then we need a form. And finally, we've built our form and we have dragged, we've reached the summit of this feature and we submit it and then we get a call and we're knocked back down to the very base because it turns out that these rectangles are too brutalist, they're too harsh. The children are blinding themselves on the, on the harsh, sharp angles of our rectangles. The users want something more modern, more app store, more dribble with three bs.com. They want rounded, they yearn for rounded rectangles. So in order to give this to them, we quickly boot up our IDE again and get right to work. We speed on through, we wanna get this done this sprint. So we add roundness to our schema and then we hunt through the code base to everywhere we else we need to change. So we go to slick and we have to of course add roundness here. So we add roundness and then of course there's the the JSON codec. So we add roundness to this. And then we move back up to the clients. We have to add it to the TypeScript definition. Now we're gonna get roundness from our backend. And now the React list needs these. And then the form needs roundness as well. And we've made it and we're so happy. And we boot up our page and it's exploded for some reason because in our celerity, we have introduced some bugs. It is very difficult to do this duplication without breaking some things. What have we done? In particular, we forgot to add a not null constraint to our roundness here. And that would have been fine in and of itself. However, in the slick definition, we did not specify that this is a column of option of doubles, which means that if we ever try to read a null value, i.e. the values already in the database, this is just going to explode because it is expecting it to be not null. And that's because we had to re-inscribe this from hand and we kind of screwed up. The other issue is that I wrote round mess here instead of roundness, which I guess could be fine in and of itself if we decided that's what we're going to call roundness on the front end, but of course it is not. We wanted it to be roundness. So every time we try to finally call it, it's going to break at runtime, which is bad. And clearly we could go ahead and fix this and, and manage all the errors, but let's stop this madness early and let's figure out a better way. So let's undo those changes and return to the, the harsh, sharp angled world for a moment and think about what, when everything went wrong. And it started here when we first reinscribed the structure of the rectangle. We built it into our slick table. And really here we could only screw up. 
there is a single source of truth that is needed, which can be the schema. And we can only lie at this point, which is what we did. We misrepresented our schema, and then we percolated that uh, lie throughout the rest of the code base. So let's delete this. And instead, let's write the same thing, except this time with this comment at the top that says, this file is generated by slick code gen. You cannot just add this comment. It has to be true. So let's imagine that we actually use slick code gen. Many other ORMs or features like this you can use to derive your code from a single source of truth. So let's do this here. We're deriving it from the schema. You can also derive the schema from some kind of uh, case class description logic. The point is, have a single source of truth and derive the other one from it. The second you start duplicating these things, the more pain you're going to cause yourself. So that's all now green representing its beauty and perfection. Here, you may have already noticed, like, why are you doing this uh, kit? This is something we don't do this. We generally uh, use the easy thing. This is a simple case. Let's derive this. We have compile time type safe macros that can introspect the structure of case classes and deterministically generate a correct instance of an encoder, which is the right instinct. Good job, good idea. I agree. And now this is derived. We no longer reference these different arguments. It's purely derived. We can't go wrong. Now we're at the clients and how do we get rid of this duplication? Well, if we're using JavaScript or TypeScript, we really can't. We could rewrite our backend in JavaScript or TypeScript, but that's one of the sort of like, now you have two problems situations. So let's not do that. And instead delete this all together and let's just use Scala again. And this can work because we're going to use Scala.js, which is a variant of, type of Java, of Scala, a variant of Scala, which can compile into beautiful, fast, performant, minimal JavaScript that will explode if you have 125 users attempting to WebSocket connect to a very small Heroku node, um, apparently. But moving on, we now are in the world of Scala.js. So we could use, a, there are Scala.js Scala .js React wrappers, but they're not very nice. And there's a much more beautiful library called Laminar, which I enjoy terribly. And you'll, you'll see here, what have we done? We got the table back, but we have no longer referenced anything. And that's because you can kind of think of the table as this dumb, pretty printing structure, it's just as the the JSON codec was. We're not doing anything special, specialized to a rectangle. We're just inspecting its shape and dumping it into a table such that it can be derived at compile time. Here I'm using a library called Magnolia, which I will link to at the end of the talk. And same with the form. We're not doing anything special here. We can simply derive a form for it, which totally works. So the, end, the code here is just render a rectangle. We're going to get briefly into laminar syntax in the next section, so ignore some of this. But as you can see, we're not referencing width or height anymore. We're just saying, give me a form for this rectangle. And now we can return to the bottom and do this feature again, except correctly. So let's add roundness here, this time with a not null constraint. And now if we take a moment, we can recode generate our slick definition and then let it compile and then it simply works because no longer did we actually have to write or reference any of these fields. They were all derived. So they're all going to be correct the first time. This was cogend and the rest is just derivations, compile time derivations that inspects the new structure and generates it. And that's that story. That's kind of the dream. If you start thinking slightly differently, you can save yourself a lot of time and pain. I would have paused for applause here, but I exploded my app. So I'm going to select this sad cannot read property applause button to find one for myself and uh, take a moment of silence. Okay. As an encore though, let's investigate this one more time, which is uh, if we have this case class, a slightly more complicated rectangle, it has some X and Y coordinates, a width and height, a rotation and a color, we can derive a form for this, which would look just like this. And this is in fact derived in the back end, which has exploded. <laughs> uh, just like this. We just render a rectangle, it implicitly derives one, a form for that rectangle, and then we get this. We could also then derive a JSON codec so I could theoretically send it to the back end and have it broadcast out to a whole bunch of listening people listening over WebSockets, unless there are of course too many of them and your app explodes. And we can also derive something called an animatable, which is something that I've been working on, which will allow you to interpolate the differences, the changes between these in a nice way, such that if I make a change to this, it will animate to its next position. I can change the height, I can change the color, and this is all just being done at compile time, I mean, except for the, the whole websockety stuff. The code for it is right here. We're just rendering the rectangle into this, into this thing called a variable and then getting a signal of the changes out of this and spring animating them. And that was causing this to animate uh, sort of beautifully across the screen. So that's, that's composing derivations. 
Now let's take a look at Laminar, that weird library that I used and have referenced with these things such as signals and variables and, and all that. The thing that I dub is better than React. So this is the code for this on the bottom here. This is the code for this. You can write divs just as call them as normal functions. You can nest them as normal functions because they are functions. This is there's no VDOM virtual DOM going on here. It's 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 all very fast. You can also nest style constructors inside of them to style them. So here's a very stylish component where we have the text and then at the same level we have style constructors which you can call with strings or you can use some pre-built preset functions that exist on them. It's very convenient. And you can call all of these inside of div because the div and these other DOM node constructors take what's called modifiers, which uh, can be children, they can be text nodes, or they can be styles, among other things. And sequences of these modifiers are also modifiers themselves, which makes it trivial to abstract things like styling or styling functions or children or what have you. You simply make functions and values. You don't need to use a library composed of template strings like you uh, could in, in JavaScript, in uh, React styled components, if you remember. And if you want a component, you can always just capitalize the first letter of your functions if that makes you feel more comfortable. And now that this is Scala, you can use case classes and ADTs and do really whatever the heck you want that you're used to doing in Scala. And it's all very minimal and lightweight and simple and fast. Here is a pretty grid of rectangles. Uh, we can just fill a sequence with 36 random rectangles and display them in a grid and it works just fine. Now let's talk about dynamics. So if we want to change values over time, how do you handle that? Well, this is a functional reactive programming library. So it uses something called signals. Here, every one second, we get a different random integer. And then we can bind the result of this integer, wrapping, mapping it to a string first as a child text node of this M element. And every time the signal changes its value, the text element will update. You can also bind signals to style properties. So here I'm generating a random color case class and turning it into a hex string, which I'm both using as the text of this child node as well as its color property. So it reflects that there. And also you can do this with anything else. So I'm get generating a random rectangle and then piping it into this. Maybe this is how you would do something like a React component in Laminar, take a signal of the properties and then map these to the various children or style, whatever, whatever you desire. In order to do form input, just as you can pipe signals and event streams into DOM elements, you can also get events out of DOM elements. So here we're getting an on input event stream out of this DOM element, which we're then mapping to the value of this input element and piping that into a variable called title here, which is a, a wrapper, a mutable primitive in, in Laminar, which wraps a string. And variables can both accept event streams or be written to explicitly, and they also yield a signal. So we can pass the signal of this text change into this celebratory banner here, and I can briefly uh, functional Scala 2020 pandering. Awesome. And likewise, you can also do this with other events and all sorts of things, API requests. That's how the votes were working before everything exploded. Uh, so here I'm taking a mouse position, doing a little bit of math on that to get the offset in the, with regards to the blue box, and then changing both the position of this pixel cursor as well as the text. All right. So now let's briefly look at, in the last five minutes, some animations, which I clearly enjoy. So if you have a signal uh, of, a, of an integer, here represented as this, this cursor on this number line, you can think of a signal as a value changing over time. So if we extend it in the y-axis, imagining the y-axis is time receding into the past, this is what a signal looks like. If we want to animate this signal, we can, instead of jumping sort of harshly between its current value and its next value, we can merely interpolate those signals. So here we can interpolate where the blue sig the blue cursor represents the interpolated position of the red cursor. In laminar code, this looks like this. The red cursor takes a signal of integers and merely uses that as its x position, whereas this one calls a spring on it. Now, this is a library that I made, the spring stuff and the animation stuff, and it's powering all the animations in here, and I will be releasing that by this weekend. I've been working on all this silliness, so I haven't had time to polish it up. Um, so here, uh, we can take a look at some other animations. Uh, this is, this is a, a little rectangle jumping ugly, uglily, uglily, is that a word? Uglily from side to side. And if we just simply add a spring, we can make it nice and cancelable and we can spring interpolate between both the color and the, uh, the position. And you can do this with multiple things. You can add delays, etc. 
And here is just a, a, a lovely shifting skein of, of rectangles for your viewing pleasure. Um, what is interesting here is that we're also deriving an animatable for rectangle because a rectangle is comprised of animatable uh, subsets, just as this works the same as we did with the JSON codec, as we did with the form and the table. You can derive these things as long as they're built out of, you know, in, it's an inductive definition. As long as the base cases here, doubles are animatable. Color is comprised of doubles and thus is also animatable. And so now every 1500 milliseconds, we can generate a new random rectangle and then spring interpolate those, which is what's happening in each of these. It's kind of nice. And here is just something, this is a uh, <laughs> JavaScript uh, origin story generator. Added too many CSS animations to Mark Anderson. What's cool about this is that it's quite difficult. I've always found that I've always liked superfluous animations and it's quite difficult to generate animations that collapse a div to its actual content height and then back down to zero in a fluid manner. Uh, but this is pretty trivial and it can be made into a reusable modifier that could be called on really any element. That's an example of this here. Um, I'm, 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 it, whether I take a signal of whether or not it's visible and I um, map that Boolean value to either the scroll width of the element or zero if it's closed. And then spring interpolate those differences and then turn that double into a pixel string. So let's take a look at this. This is just some pretty stuff. This is a, uh, you can also do this with SVGs in Laminar. So here I have some SVG grids bouncing around and their smiles correspond to how much room they have. Uh, so they get sad if they have no room or they get really happy if they get a lot of room. And lastly, as our final example before the end, because this is Scala, we can use Scala libraries. So I've made a, at zio.search.sh, you can see a whole bunch of vis visual examples of Zio, which use Laminar, they use this animation library, but they also can use Zio itself, which is the best candidate for simulating Zio. Here I can just run these examples. Uh, here I'm showing off the zip par combinator, which is showing two random numbers getting got in parallel. And this is just simulating it by connecting to a running actual Zio effect and linking some of its behavior to these variable properties, which I then have a render function for. And it's quite trivial. That code base is currently open source. This one will be soon, even though, as you can imagine, it is quite verbose. So we have reached the end. Uh, yeah. Uh, I thank you. I'm sorry my app exploded, but at least we got to do it like this. I have some resources, which once I get the website back up, I will um, link to. And uh, I can also put these in the chat. You can ask me about them. Laminar is this beautiful library that I love so much. It has changed my front end life. Magnolia is what I've been using for deriving everything. Once you get, once you learn how to do it, and it's quite simple to learn. It's a little, you know, there's a bit of a curve, but it, once you learn it, you've learned it and you get very addicted to it. You want to derive everything. And then Zio, uh, Zio was, was used for the back end. I need to feed it some more uh, RAM next time uh, I, <laughs> for 150 uh, people joining simultaneously. Um, and uh, yeah, some e-sources, I will put this in the chat. I work for a company called uh, uh, Axony. Um, so if you're curious about that, please email me about it. Um, otherwise, that's, that's it. Uh, thank you. I hope that was weird and interesting. Please ask me lots of questions. <laughs>